Again, we are thankful to God for allowing us yet again the privilege of not only a new day, but a day in which we get to render unto him praise that he is due. I recognize the sensitivity of the times in which we currently find ourselves. This crisis, as has been described as being unprecedented, something that we have not seen before. But I want to remind you that God is still on the throne. And if God is not worried, we need not be worried. God has all power in his hand. And whether we understand it at this time or perhaps at a later time, we must be reminded that what God permits he so does because he has a purpose in all that he allows. Our job is just to make sure that we incline our spirit with his spirit so that we might do that which is pleasing and acceptable in his sight. And when he sees fit to change our present circumstances, uh, certainly he will do that on his time. But in the meantime, we ought to still render to him this worship, this praise. And it is so comforting to know that in the midst of such trials as these, that people are coming together, folk from all over the country are on this teleconference, folk who we have not been connected with before. So that lets me know that even though we are socially disconnected, we are spiritually connected. Social distancing does not have to keep us from our God and certainly does not have to keep us from the fellowship that we enjoy one with another. And we're thankful that we have the technology to go about this in a different way. I want to thank my lovely wife who is engineering the computer she is the one who is muting calls, and when we have different individuals who are praying, singing, offering scripture, or whatever it is they may be doing, she's chasing their names around a computer screen, figuring out who to mute, who to unmute, and it is always good to say thank you, and I am at this time wanting to express to her her thanks for assisting me, and I didn't know that's what being a help meet meant but uh, I am discovering that a help meet also has reference to her helping me with technology and we just uh, want to say thank you to her. Uh, nonetheless, we know there is a word from the Lord and I wanna invite you to 1 Thessalonians chapter one. I thank Brother Doug, one of our uh, newer converts uh, for reading the scripture for us this morning. Brother Doug's a great man and we appreciate him and are just thankful uh, for he and his uh, wife, Sister Barbara. First uh, Thessalonians chapter one, and we will read verse number seven and verse number eight. As I always say, when you find it, smile and say amen. And don't just say amen, but make sure you smile when you say amen. <clears throat> First Thessalonians chapter one and verse number seven. The Bible says, so that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread ab abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. Notice the phrase, but also in every place, your faith to God is spread abroad. The subject for this morning's lesson is Christian and contagious. Christian and contagious. The word contagious, it evokes fear 
had a concern for safety. We think about just in recent years, how many times we have heard something being contagious that has alarmed us and made us go to extra precautions to protect ourselves from some infectious, contagious illness We've heard about, of course, the coronavirus. In recent years, we have had to deal with the H1N1 influenza, Ebola, SARS, an epidemic of measles, and so many other things that are contagious, that offer the possibility of sickness and the potential for death. When we think of something that is contagious, diseases spread from one person to another, from one geographical area to another, because any time an infected person makes contact with another, they transmit from one to the other that which is deemed to be contagious. Oftentimes, the infected person does not know how they affect others. You can transmit an illness not knowing that you even have the illness. You can transmit what's in you, even though you don't know what's in you is in you. Doctors tell us that we transmit things by primarily our nose, our mouth, and our hand. In a matter of speaking, I want us to understand that we are all carriers of something. Our immune system wards bacteria and viruses and germs away from us on a daily basis. We rarely give thought or give a second thought to what may be invading our bodies and what we may be transmitting to others. And because God equipped us with an immune system that builds antibodies and an immune system that fights all things. Many times we don't know what we're giving somebody or what someone has given to us because the reality is that our immune system deals with these things before, if ever, we are aware of what we might have. In any given day, we pass and collect bacteria, germs, and viruses and have no clue about it. But I want you to understand as we consider this thought of Christians being contagious, that contagion can reference different realms of reality. Obviously, a person can be contagious in the physical realm because our bodies have the ability to pass on in biology from one person to another, we can transmit an illness. I want you to think also that we can be contagious in the social realm, in that we can affect other people by making contact with them. You can have a bad attitude and that rubs off on somebody. You can have a troubled spirit. You can have an uneasy countenance and, and you can transmit that to someone. So you have to be careful, not only physically of what you transmit to others, but you have to also recognize that socially your attitude and behavior can infect and affect someone else. And so be very careful about how you conduct yourself. But for the purposes of this discussion today, I want us to think not just in the physical realm about being contagious, not just in the social realm, but I want us to think spiritually about being contagious. I want us to understand this from the standpoint that all of us spiritually have something in us, and what is in us can damage or deliver a soul. What's in you, what comes from your nose, what comes from your mouth, what comes from your touch, spiritually speaking, that is, has the potential to affect someone and you can transmit spiritually to someone something that can damage them 
or you can transmit something that can deliver them. The truth of the matter is that as we look across this nation, many of our churches are low in membership. The numbers are not what they used to be. Perhaps God has allowed this novel coronavirus issue to get our attention and to bring us back to the idea that we need him and that regardless as to how busy we are, worship needs to be a priority. But I also believe that we need to look at our churches and recognize that if a church is dead, if a lost soul continues without the Lord, and a coroner from heaven had to write up an autopsy to explain a dead church or a lost soul. The truth of the matter is that the autopsy report would have to read that some churches are dead and some souls are lost because that church or those souls came into contact with contaminated Christians. There have been Christians who have allowed negative contaminations and spiritual viruses and, and spiritual germs and spiritual bacteria in them to cause them to be the source of contamination and killing the church and killing the soul. And we have to be careful that we don't allow the church and others to be hurt by what's in us person can also be delivered because of a Christian. A church can also be blessed because a contagious Christian is spreading the love of God, spreading the joy of God, the forgiveness of God, the kindness of God. When we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 8, we see something encouraging about being contagious because Paul, in speaking to the church at Thessalonica, says, your faith to God were is spread. When we think of contagious, we think of something spreading. And so just as a person can spread contamination, just as a person can spread a spiritual virus, just as a person could spread disease and germs spiritually, a person's faith can be contagious. A person's faith can challenge others. A person's faith can help others. It can reach others. It can spread abroad. We have, of course, a pandemic in our country. We have a pandemic across this world. People are saddened by the reality that every day folks are dying. And I look at this perhaps through the lenses of a preacher. And I wonder why it is that physical death creates so much alarm in the minds of Christians. Why is it that we are so saddened that people are dying? Husbands and wives are dying, multiple people and families are dying. And people say it weighs heavy in their spirits to see this death because of the coronavirus. And maybe I'm just a preacher, but I am baffled by the surprise. And you might find that to be strange. How is it as a preacher I could seemingly be so insensitive to death? How is it as a preacher I could not be touched by the loss of lives? And I want you to understand it's not that I am insensitive to death. It's not that I don't share and empathize with those who suffer loss. But what the church has got to understand is that long before the coronavirus, people were dying every day. Long before the coronavirus, people were dying. And worse than the coronavirus, people were dying outside of the law. And so where were the cries then for souls? Where was the cry then? Where was the concern? Where were the heavy hearts 
in our churches when we have fought about power, in our families when we have occupied ourselves with everything but prayer and devotion in our coming together when we've not come together for the good, where were the cries then for the souls of people? When we have talked about any and everything but what is an agenda to God and priority to God, what about delinquent souls? Where, where was the cry, where was the concern for people who are not attending church, people who have perhaps been contaminated by somebody, people who perhaps have been touched by some negative person who no longer wants to come to church. Where, what about the people that we see on our jobs and our families and our neighborhoods and our schools every day that do not know Jesus? Why haven't we had the same level of a heavy heart and a burdened spirit for them the same as we have for people dying from the coronavirus. The coronavirus is not the enemy. The coronavirus is not the problem. Eternal damnation is the enemy. Eternal damnation is the problem. Those who are dying outside of Christ, that's where our heart should bleed. That's where our heart should be burdened. That's where our spirit should be overwhelmed. And it should not have to take a virus to remind us that death is not final and that when people go through death's door, they have to answer to God and they will live eternally. The question is, where will they live? Sometimes I wonder if people really believe that hell is real. I want you to look at how we can be a Christian and be contagious. And not contagious because we negatively pass on spiritual contaminated viruses to another, but be like this church at Thessalonica whose faith was spread abroad. The first thing that I want you to notice as we consider from the Centers for Disease Control how viruses are passed on, we are told that they're passed first through the nose. That's why they recommend six feet of distance between two individuals because when you sneeze, what is in you comes out of you and affects those around you. Let me remind us that what's in you comes out of you and affects those around you. Now think of this and move from a biological understanding to a spiritual understanding. What is in your spirit that comes out of you so that in your proximity to others, it affects those that you are around? See, if, you, if you've got some hell in you, if you've got some hatred in you, if you've got some anger in you, some bitterness in you, some, some, some sin in your spirit, you can't help but to affect folk around you because you only get out of you what's in you in the first place. Uh, when, when I look at Thessalonica, I, I want you to see what was in them that affected those around them. If you're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, notice verse number 6. The Bible says, and you became followers of us. Uh, that, that's a preaching point right there. See, one of the problems we have in the church is don't nobody want to follow. Everybody want to be in charge. Everybody want to lead. Everybody wants position and prominence and prestige and power. But somebody's got to learn how to follow. He says, and you became followers of us and of the Lord. See, there's nothing wrong with following if you're following the right person. 
Paul does not say you're following me. He says you're following me as you follow the Lord. But I want you to notice this phrase in verse number six, having received the word. I want you to underline, highlight, give attention to the word receive. The word receive there, it has a meaning that should not be overlooked or undervalued. That word receive means to embrace. It means to accept. It means to welcome. You, you, you cannot overlook this word and understand what Paul is saying in the text. He is saying that the reason in verse 8 that when they spread the word, just, just look at this idea of spreading, the idea that what's in you comes out of you, that's what you spread, that's what comes from your nose. That's what's in you. He says the reason that your faith spreads is because faith is what's in you in the first place. How do we know that? Because he uses the word receive, which means they embrace this. They accepted this. They welcomed this. This is what was in them. And so when they made contact with others, that's what came out of them because what was in them in the first place was the word of God. And we have to especially appreciate the church at Thessalonica because their, the entrance of the Thessalonican believers into the kingdom was not easy. It came through hardship and headache. See, one of the things that is our problem is that we're spoiled today. We don't like something. We stop coming to church. Somebody make us mad. I don't want to come to church no more. I don't like the temperature in the auditorium. Somebody didn't call my name in prayer. Somebody took my seat. Somebody didn't acknowledge me. Somebody didn't say thank you. Somebody broke up with me. Somebody mistreated me. We are spoiled. We don't know what persecution is. And then what we do is that we just shift ourselves around and we contaminate every place we go because we've not dealt with ourselves. See, we keep projecting onto others what we've not dealt with in ourselves. And then what we do is I'm moving, I'm going somewhere else, and we keep shifting around and shifting around and shifting around. And just like a coronavirus, all we are doing is we're taking our spiritual junk and gunk and we are contaminating folk where we go because we've not gotten out of us what shouldn't be in us in the first place, and we spread that around. And that may be because we are spoiled. Look at Acts chapter 17. Let me illustrate this, and let me show you how the church at Thessalonica had its humble beginnings. They didn't have a song fest that everybody felt good about. They didn't have those cuddly experiences that we all love. The church at Thessalonica, it started through pain. It started through suffering and struggle, through persecution. And maybe that's why they embraced God more and embraced his word. Maybe that's why they accepted God and welcomed God. Because see, when you're persecuted, you don't have time for some of these immature excuses as to why we don't go to church and why we unhappy and why we not satisfied. I don't like the song leader. The preacher preached too long. The preacher don't preach long enough. This person took my seat. This person this. This person that. We so upset. But when we look at the church at Thessalonica, it was through pain and persecution. They wouldn't spoil like we are today. Notice Acts chapter 17 and verse number one. The Bible says now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. This is the same Thessalonica we're reading about. It says, where was a synagogue of the Jews? And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, 
and that this Jesus whom I preach to you is Christ. Now, I want you to stop right there. I want you to notice what Paul was preaching. Paul didn't preach no tickling sermon, no feel good sermon, no make you comfortable sermon. Paul preached a sermon about the suffering of Jesus and how that Jesus uh, was crucified. Jesus was beat. He was put on the cross. He was pierced in the side. We, when, when we listen to verse number three, Paul is not preaching a prosperity sermon. He's not preaching one of those sermons that said, this is your year for a breakthrough. This is your year. This is your year for increase. This is your year for more. Paul preached Jesus. And that's what we've got to do is we've got to get back to Jesus. It's not about us. It's never been about us. It will never be about us. It's about Jesus, the Christ, and we have to get back to Jesus. Notice verse number four, if you're still in Acts chapter 17, the Bible says, and some of them believe and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude and of the chief women, uh, not a few, but the Jews, which believe not move with envy, took them took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jacob, Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. The church at Thessalonica did not start with a feel-good gospel meeting it did not start with a feel-good song service. It did not start with a youth program. It did not start with folk who were cozy and comfortable. It started with people who were persecuted from day one, people who were experiencing pain from day one, people who were acquainted with problems from day one. And so no wonder when we read 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and it says they received the word, they embraced the word, they accepted the word, they welcomed the word because they weren't spoiled. And we have to be very careful that as we try to reach people around us, that we don't forget to lay aside some of our selfish, immature, less than Christ-like thinking and remember that souls are at stake. When we think about the nose, what comes out is based on what's in. What should be in us that should come out of us is a concern with where people are going to spend eternity. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 3, how many of you have prayed this prayer? In this verse in Colossians 4 and 3, Paul does not ask God for bigger, better, and more. He doesn't say, Lord, I need a promotion on my job. Lord, I need more money. Lord, I need to get married. Lord, I need children. Lord, I need this. I need that. He says, my prayer is that I can tell somebody about Jesus. In Colossians 4 and verse number 3, with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. How many times do we pray and say, Lord, you blessed me with a new day. Help me to tell somebody about Jesus today. And some of you say, well, preacher, that, that, that's, that was a preacher talking. That was a preacher asking God to give him a door of utterance. And I submit to you that all of us need to pray for a door of utterance. You might not be a preacher, but you've got a testimony. You might not be a preacher, but you come into contact with people. You might not be a preacher, but, but symbolically and spiritually speaking, you sneeze on people every day. That is, whatever is in you comes out and affects those around you. What's in you that positively affects those around you and infects them with the word of God. Do people see some God and, or do we find ourselves like the rich man in Luke chapter 16? It is interesting in Luke chapter 16, 
the rich man was enjoying his riches while he was living. But in hell, when he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, one of the things that became important to him is evangelism. He didn't say we need another song fest, and I'm not criticizing singing. I love good singing. I'm, I'm not in any way criticizing socializing, entertaining in the Lord. I'm not criticizing the things that we do that we enjoy. I'm just saying we have to prioritize. In Luke chapter 16 and verse number 27, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. It is interesting that the rich man in hell found evangelism important. The concerns for people's souls became important in hell. Let's not in any way experience hell, but certainly let's not wait till we die to be concerned about evangelism. Let's make sure that we sneeze on folk every day, that we infect them with the word of God and we affect them by the spirit of God in us that comes out of us and impacts those around us. Not only are people contagious because of their nose, they're contagious secondly because of their mouth. We have to be ever mindful of what we say. There have been times, even in my own life, I have wondered when people have said things, what did they hope to get out of what they said? What was their motive in saying that? And you always get folk who want to tell you what somebody else is saying. And I'm one of these people, I tend to believe that's what you think when you tell me somebody else is saying. But when we speak, do we understand how we are going to be accountable for the words that we speak? In Matthew chapter 12, for example, I believe it is verse number 36, where Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12 and 36, but I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Understand that everything you say is being recorded by God. And you're going to have to give an account for everything that you say. That is why in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 24, the Bible teaches us about putting on the new man. See, the new man don't talk like, doesn't talk like the old man used to talk. And how do we know this? Because in Ephesians 4, when you drop down to verse number 29, he says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying, the word edifying means building, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. If you're going to be contagious, don't spread gossip. Don't spread backbiting. Don't spread words that stir division. Don't spread false doctrine. Don't spread whispering and don't spread talking with an earshot of somebody that you're talking to or talking about, but you don't want to talk to or saying something that you know that if they hear it, they're going to go back and tell it. Don't allow that to be what you spread. If, if you're going to spread something, think about uh, the church at Thessalonica again and verse number eight when it says that their faith spread. How do we spread our faith? Give you three ways in which we can from our mouth spread our faith. Number one, 
things that provide for edification as we looked at in Ephesians chapter four. We, we need to build people. People get tore down enough on their jobs. They get tore down enough by bill collectors. They get tore down enough in broken marriages. They get tore down enough in their communities. People don't need anyone else to tear them down. People need somebody to build them up, somebody who's concerned with them and loves them, and somebody who is able to speak something in them that helps them to be a better person. In Romans chapter 15, it's verse number two. In Romans chapter 15, in verse number two, the Bible says in Romans 15, verse number two, let every one of us, that doesn't say every one of y'all, but let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. We ought to be in the business of spreading, being contagious with edification. It, it ought to be of such that when I come to the church, no matter how much I've been torn down, I, I just get infected by those who've been affected by the word of God and that I can't leave church without being built up. I can't leave church without being encouraged. I, I don't have to go to church to hear gossip and backbiting and division and, and all of that and folk whispering about me. I get enough of that in the world, but I get built up in the church. So number one, from the mouth needs to be edification. Number two, from the mouth needs to be encouragement. I have never met a person who could say that they don't need a little bit more encouragement. The word encourage means to deposit courage. In means to put in, to deposit. Encouragement from the word courage. So when you put that together, we need to make a deposit of courage. It is in the same letter to the church at Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 11, where the Bible says, wherefore comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. So it is the idea of edifying each other and encouraging each other. And notice that before he tells us to edify, he says, comfort yourselves together. There ought to just be some encouragement knowing that we together, that, that I may not be able to stop the rain in your life, but I can hold the umbrella. We, we can go on a journey together. We, we can struggle together. We can suffer together. See, sometimes people don't understand what builds great relationships is not folk who are there with you when the sun is shining. See, sometimes people don't understand the bonds you have with people. They don't understand the close relationships you have with people, the fellowship that you have with people. And it's not the people who's been there when you've gone through uh, good times is people who've been there when you've gone through the bad times. It's it's the folk who, who have stuck by your side, people who were there to give you a shoulder to lean on, people who loved you, people who walked with you, people who didn't abandon you, people who didn't forsake you, people who were there through some tough times in your life. You never forget those kinds of people. See, everybody love you when you got something going for you. But when it's raining, you do good to find two or three friends. You find yourself like Paul who says, Demas has forsaken me. And let's just be judgment day honest. All of us have some Demases in our lives, people who we thought that we could count on, that we had to count out. Not only does healthy speaking from the mouth Contagious Christianity is not only edifying, not only is it encouraging, but contagious Christianity is about being effective and promoting and preserving the message of Christ. Contagious Christianity from the mouth is about saying what edifies, what encourages, and what is effective in promoting and preserving the message of Christ. We are God's representatives and we need to sound like we represent God. Third and last, germs, 
bacteria and viruses are not only passed from the nose, usually through sneezing, from the mouth through talking, but also through touch. You touch something that's contaminated and you run the risk of being contaminated. That's why they tell us something that we hear every day, wash your hands. I'm baffled as to why you have to tell grown folks to wash their hands. We were taught to wash our hands as little kids, but for some reason, grown folk don't seem to get the message, and you all know that to be true. We go in public bathrooms all the time, and we comment about people we see come out not having washed their hands. We go to restaurants often where we see people blow their noses and then pick up and eat as if they have not just contaminated uh, their hands. Uh, we assume this to be common sense, but millions of dollars are being spent right now to teach us to do the very basic thing that we were supposedly taught to do as children, which is wash your hands. And the reason is because germs, bacteria, viruses stick on your hands. Things are spread by what you touch. If you're going to be preserved as a Christian, just as biologically we have to be careful what we touch, even spiritually, we must be careful about what we touch. And 2 Corinthians chapter 6, if you will, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, God offers to us the privilege of being his children and dwelling with him and, and him with us. But he tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, be careful what you touch. Notice verse 17, wherefore come out from among them and be you separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. What God is telling us has nothing to do with a coronavirus or a biological function. What he's talking about here when he says, don't touch, don't put your hands on an unclean thing, is not biological in nature. It is spiritual in nature. He is saying, do not contaminate yourself with touching things that are not spiritual. In other words, don't put yourself in a position where your spirituality can be tainted and contaminated because you are indulging in what you ought not be indulging in. You ought to be careful what you touch because it has the potential to not only infect you, but it can affect others because when you touch it and then you touch somebody else, we pass that on. That's why we see certain traits and behaviors in families and in social groups because people pass on to those what's in them and what's on them. You have a bad attitude and you keep touching and influencing people, they'll have a bad attitude. But you have a good attitude, a positive attitude, a an edifying attitude, a spiritual attitude, an upbeat attitude, an encouraging attitude, and you start touching people with that, you can't help but to change folk around you. See, we are all contagious. The question is, what are you passing on? Are you passing on contamination or are you passing on Christianity? In 1 Timothy chapter 5, our final scripture, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 22 1 Timothy 5 and verse 22, the Bible says, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure.
cure. Yesterday in our evening conversation, we talked about certain things that we heard as children, received a lot of phone calls and texts after the call last night. We appreciate the positive feedback. But one of the things that we hear, I did not mention this yesterday, but this is important as we look at 1 Timothy 5, verse 22. We were taught as children, birds of a feather. Y'all know the rest of the story. Birds of a feather flock together. You, you have to be careful. We're also told if you lie down with dogs, you get up with fleas. And I can't hear you, but I can see some of y'all smiling and laughing now because y'all 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 miss some of these sayings we, we used to hear. Birds of a feather flock together. You lie down with dogs, you get up with fleas. That's what Paul is saying in 1 Timothy 5 and verse number 22. You have to be careful who you run with. You have to be careful because you may think that you are an outsider to their sin. Well, I just hang out with them because they cool, they fun, they more sincere than some of them hypocrites in the church and all this other nonsense that we say to justify our indulgence in a sinful environment. And what Paul is saying here is you run the risk when you touch that, you may become contaminated and you may pass that on to somebody else. So you have to not be a partaker of this sin so that you can remain pure. I, I want to, to, to close this message out with this understanding. I am certainly sensitive and empathetic to the coronavirus. There's not a person among us who is not affected in some kind of way. And I am not sure what the end will be and how long and what will be the strategy used to get us beyond the storm. But I do want to say that beyond this biological virus, there's a spiritual virus of sin. And we have to remember that just as folk are dying from the coronavirus, Folks are dying in sin. And the same level of concern that we have that every time we see on the news, every time we see in our families, every time we get an alert on our phone that somebody else has died from corona, how many times do you look at people dying in sin and have the same level of concern for their soul? As Christians, we ought to be like the church at Thessalonica, they were Christian and they were contagious because the Bible again says that their faith spread. That's what contagious does. It spreads. Things spread because of our nose, our mouth, and our touch. Make sure that just as we are cautioning ourselves about spreading a virus biologically, that we don't spread through our nose, our mouth, or our touch spiritually anything that contaminates others. But if we're going to be contagious, may we spread that which is helpful in saving a soul so that the record of divine history may record that not only were we contagious, but in our being contagious, we infected others with the word of God we infected others with the spirit of God. We infected others because we have been contagious and we wanted to spread. May God bless you and may God keep you as we ask at this time for another song.